I'm talking to Lawrence Ryan today, who has a display of vintage cameras on at the uh, in the in the foyer of the Cara uh, Council. Now, Lawrence, you're particularly proud of this camera. Can you tell us how it works? Well, I can, uh, Gary. And the reason I'm particularly proud of it, it's a camera that actually relates back to Cara, back to the turn of last century. Because one of the uh, photographers in town was a fellow by the name of JJ Kelly, who had a photographic studio that was located opposite the courthouse in Kendall Street. And this was his studio camera. And uh, to think that it survived after all those years, it goes back, uh, it's been in my family for a long while. It was purchased by my great uncle Artie Lowe, or Arthur Lowe, um, at the sale when Kelly closed his business in 1919 and moved to Bathurst. He sold off all his equipment out of the, cam the Cara store. The camera was one of those items. And uh, what the story goes is that uh, he actually wanted the camera, but he had to take the glass negatives that went with it. So, <laughs> so as well as his camera, um, my family ended up the owner of around about 200 6x4 glass plate negatives that show care from 1899 through until 1919. And, uh, and they're still in my, my collection as well. But the camera I'm particularly proud of, it's a handmade thing, it's all, uh, all beautifully crafted timber. It was made by a, a company called Squire & Co in Sydney. Um, I'd imagine they were probably made to order in those days. But everything about it is, is movable and openable. And while it's quite fragile, the bellows here are very fragile these days, you can still see things the way it used to work. For example, if you undo these catches here, you can lift the, the lens out. And it's a, when you look at it operating, you think it was built in the 1890s. It's a, a beautiful bit of gear in its own right. But you look in here, you've got a, a shutter in here that's worked by a spring that uh, winds up and controls a, a piece of, uh, of material that fits, that uh, you roll up, press the button, it drops down and exposes your, uh, your uh, negative, which is at the back of the camera. So that's a bit like a curtain on the stage. Very much like a curtain on the stage, Gary. Now, mind you, you didn't have a, it wasn't like today, you couldn't use this camera for taking a snapshot. <laughs> it was pretty slow. The shutter speed was, a, was around about 1 20th of a second, so, and the films weren't particularly um, light sensitive. So what you had to do was you had to set them up. I've actually got the case that this, it was in the case is falling to pieces, but inside the case is a piece of black material that you would have put over the top of this, you would have put over uh, the photographer's head, you would have uh, released the shutter and away it, and away it goes. The, the negatives fitted in the back here. And the way you focused it critically to make sure it was all right, you focused on this screen here, which was glass. So it's, and it's, if you could see closely, it's got uh, pencil lines around it. So that lets you know the exact size of your negative that was going to be uh, going to be used. So then you'd position it, you'd aim it at the right spot, you'd get an image out of it there, and then you would open that. As you can see, this hinges upwards. Again, very fragile these days, but. It, hinges upwards and that slotted into there goes this, which is your film back. You've got it all set up ready to go. Your film back goes in, slides in like that and then you open it with one of these slides. No, it's jammed on me Gary, sorry about that. <laughs> but I will open it and show you no. that inside when you open it is one of the old glass, glass negatives. Now, of course, this one's been in there for probably the best part of 100 years, so it's not in good, not in good condition. A bit overexposed, you it's might say. It's a little bit overexposed, <laughs> but that's how you actually took your, took your photos in those days. And this one, I always think it's... I've got a number of these slides. This one is number three and four, <laughs> so there's ten of them. So when he went out on the road taking his photos, he had ten images that he could, could, could take, take. in one hit. So, yeah. so in this, Gary, this is an interesting little camera. It's a... Uh, that's a little micro camera that was made by uh, Japanese people just after the end of the Second World War. Interesting thing, this type of camera was first produced in 1939, so I've always thought you know, it would have probably been quite a good little useful spy camera for the Japanese in the lead up to World War II. The interesting thing is, of course, when you look at the shape of it, it's exactly the same shape as a modern camera. So even though cameras these days are digital, uh, the good quality ones still have this same body shape that dates back to 1939. It's very interesting when you compare it. One of the other cameras I have here is a German Braun from 1954 when you hold them side by side and there really isn't that much difference in, in the actual cameras as far as the look of them. You know, they've basically got the same sort of setup. This one 15 years older and a much smaller design and this one in 1954. Now, the other interesting thing of course is that uh, 
both uh, the micro camera that came out of Japanese, the Japanese uh, factories and the brawn camera that came out of German factories, the companies that produced them both had wartime production that didn't only produce cameras. So I'll leave that one. <laughs> leave with that. But uh, the other, some of the other things you can see, um, the micro cameras have always fascinated people. There's a little micro camera out of the early, early 70s. Again, a an, an little Asian camera. Uses uh, 110 film, this one. And uh, again, not as small as the, the little micro uh, brand camera from the 1940s. But this one's quite interesting and inexpensive little camera. Uh, like all of them here, it's operational. But these were one-use cameras. The idea was once you'd taken your... Uh, taking your photos, it had to actually be broken open to get the, uh, to get the film out. So they were, had one use only and then you threw them away. This sort of camera, while film cameras you think are sort of old hat these days, this sort of camera is still produced in Asia and you can actually buy them on the shelf. Still in the same basic shape, a little bit smaller than this now, but same basic shape and still in a variety of colours too. So that was a, that's an interesting little camera. And of course, today we always have our a great love of, of cameras that are give you an instant picture. Well, of course, before digital, you had the Polaroid cameras, and uh, this was a Polaroid E66 camera. This one is actually my camera that I bought brand spanking new from Critcher's Pharmacy back in uh, 1976. I know I saved up for it because I was going on holidays up to Queensland. I want the camera to take with me, so this is the camera I saved up for. I can't remember. I don't, can't find the price anymore, but it was either $29 or $39. <laughs> the, the interesting thing with this one, of course, is that it still takes photos today. It's actually got film in it, and the, um, I've used a, a number of my photos in books and publications over the years. This camera, the photos that I took with this camera, are still usable and still copyable today. The, uh, some of the other cameras that I have, the old 126 cameras, they don't work at all because the images are broken down so badly. But the images that this thing took were critically sharp and still usable and you can scan them in and they give you a really excellent coverage today still. So that's a, that's a camera that I use for the best part of probably from about 76 to 82 before I got my first uh, uh, SLR camera and it was a great little camera to use pretty simple. I even got the flash cube on the sides too. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I use that one a lot. Now Olive Cotton used that in larger uh, and she was very famous as a photographer and came from Cowra. Absolutely, she was probably one of uh, Australia's most famous women photographers and when she was was partnered with Max Dupain, of course. Uh, they were probably the most uh, influential power couple of photography in Australia in the 1930s and early 1940s. Um, yeah, that enlarger is actually Olive's um, enlarger from the studio that was here in Cow, where the Clare building is now. Now, I certainly can remember Olive Cotton when she was based in there, and uh, Olive was probably better known to a lot of Cowra people as a maths teacher up at Cowra High School and a photographer. Uh, but if you look at some of her work, uh, it hangs in galleries all over Australia. That's a, an Astron enlarger. They were fairly common sort of enlargers. I had one uh, exactly the same as that one myself. Uh, hers has a little bit better um, system of raising and lowering that my poor old one did. It had a winder on it, but <laughs> that was a pretty good quality enlarger. Uh, Olive actually had two enlargers. She had a very large one that was for glass plate negatives and that uh, enlarger is held by the Historical Society. The Historical Society also owned that particular enlarger as well. It was donated to them by Olive's daughter, Sally McInerney. And uh, it's fully operational. Um, I was asked to have a look at it by the Historical Society. It was all in pieces. And of course, as soon as I saw it, I knew exactly how it went back together. So <laughs> we were able to put it back together pretty quickly. And, uh, and we wanted the electricians rewired it so that uh, it's safe to use. And it actually put it a fully operational enlarger. Now, it's a great piece of history and a great photographic uh, icon to hold here in Cairo. Now, what other cameras do we have in this, um, in this uh, cavern of... Of treasures. Well, there's quite a few that, uh, that I suppose have iconic places in my own heart. Down the bottom, we've got a couple of box brownies, um, and they belonged to uh, one is my wife Robin, the larger one belongs to her grandmother, who used to live out at, uh, at Reed's uh, flat, Ella Chown. And there was a book that came out about Reed's flat in uh, probably about 10 years ago now, and there was a whole heap of photographs that were taken by Ella Chown in it, and she would have taken them using that particular um, box brownie. That one dates back to 1923-1924, whereas the smaller one, it's a much more modern one, it dates back to 1953. The box brownies are quite an amazing camera when you think about it. 
the, uh, the box brownies, they were first um, developed in about 1902 and they were still in production in 1963. So when you think 61 years of box brownie cameras, <laughs> uh, Kodak did pretty well out of them, I think. And of course, they were the really the start of snapshot cameras. The old, um, the old saying with Kodak was, you press the button and we do the rest. And, <laughs> and they're the ones that they used to press the button for. But both of them still fully operational again. So that's the great thing with a lot of the cameras in this collection, all bar the very early, uh, early camera. They all still work, so that's the great thing about them. Now, one that I have a, a, a very special connection with is this one. This camera has probably had more uh, published photographs taken with it than any other camera in Cowra. Because, uh, as some of you might know, I worked for Kibler's Home and Trade Centre for many years, and I used to do the advertising for Kibler's Home and Trade Centre. And on the front page of every Cowra Guardian, there was a photograph of something we were selling at the time. And then also on page five, there was a strip uh, in the Friday Guardian of specials from Kibler's. Well, this is the camera that took every one of those photographs. Takes a three and a half inch floppy disk in there. You've got about four images on that three and a half inch floppy <laughs> disk. This one has an interesting story. It was one of the first digital cameras that came to Kibler's. And it was sitting on the shelf. It was price new was $1,800. And one of the staff at Kibler's dropped it. And it busted the case. And we'd got it in for a customer and the customer didn't want it. So we sent it back to the manufacturer and got it them to fix the case up. It came back in. We had a choice. We could either try and sell it as a as a used second, yeah. or we kept it as the works camera. <laughs> we kept it the works camera. I used it right up until the closing of Kibler's when Kibler's became Bunnings in 2011. So I used this camera right to the finish. And at the end, Michael Ricker, who was the owner of Kibler's at that stage, says, "Well, you might as well keep it. You're the one who used it most." <laughs> so that's how come I came to inherit this one. And like all the others still fully operational so that's the great that's thing incredible. that's the great thing about it but uh, yeah so i always say to people pick the camera that would have taken more photos than any other than the Cara guardian <laughs> and you can say well that one might have because it was in use from 1949 to 1964 <laughs> but i would bet you this one had run a close second to it so, <laughs> so uh, gary it was a great camera and a very close connection to me with that one i've got to say